So, welcome to the channel, That Retired Guy. Thanks for tuning in. This is going to be a special episode for all my beer drinking friends out there. I'm calling it Strange Brew. You know, like the song. Now, depending on how old you are, you're going to remember this song as either from Cream or Eric Clapton. But either way, the first verse goes something like this. She's a witch of trouble, an electric brew, in her own mad mind she's in love with you. Now, a little poetic license there, yeah, but electric brew, that's what we're talking about. In this video, I'm going to be giving you a tour of my son's and my hobby, uh, latest hobby, beer making. And in particular, I'm going to focus on how we make beer in an electric brewery. Now, some of you may not be motivated to make your own craft beer, but I'm hoping this video may also be of interest just to those with kind of a natural curiosity about how things are made. I mean, there actually was a TV show called How It's Made. I, I used to watch that all the time. You know, they make show you how they make rubber balls or saxophones or rice cookers. I mean, heck, I love just watching construction crews building things. I don't know. Anyway, uh, if that doesn't, uh, if this doesn't just tickle your fancy, am I allowed to say that? Anyway, <laughs> stay tuned, and I'm going to give you the bottom line uh, about beer making right up front. Anyway, so I hope you find this video interesting, and if you're looking to make beer or learn about electric breweries, this bud's for you. Now, you may ask, uh, what qualifies me to make a video about electric breweries and beer making? Well, when it comes to the electric brewery part, I'm going to rely on the advice of my son. I mean, he's a graduate aerospace engineer, after all, and he built the whole system from parts. I like saying my son's a rocket scientist. I wonder if they make uh, bumper stickers about that. Anyway, uh, now when it comes to the fine art of fermenting uh, grains and making, you know, adult beverages, I've got some personal experience there. You see, my first job after I had graduated was as a lab tech at the original uh, Seagram's Distillery in Waterloo, Ontario. I mean, uh, this thing was built back in 1857. It's the original place. Now, my job was to culture yeast, uh, adjust the water chemistry, monitor the sugar and alcohol content. I even worked on uh, whiskey tasting and blending. And, uh, oh yeah, I was the uh, Seagram's gin maker, entrusted with all those secret formulas. Uh, that was really cool, making up those big batches of gin and copper stills. Anyway, my son and I, we took to this electric brewery, as they say, like two ducks take to water. Now, to be fair, I know some of you are not interested in getting too far into the weeds on all this. You know, the whole how-to of beer making. So let me boil it down for you, as they say. Um, here are a few of the key takeaways. First, what does an electric brewery look like? And uh, next, you know, what would it cost to build one? And lastly, what does it cost to make your own beer? Well, here are a couple of charts that will give you some idea on each of these questions. Okay, the first chart I want to show you is a drawing of our electric brewery. And it shows you uh, all the different equipment that's needed to set up a, an electric brewery. It's really a collection of... Um, boil kettles and uh, fermenter, a chiller, some pumps, and a computer controller. Let's take a look at the, uh, basically this is the brains of the electric brewery. It's a computer uh, software program and a controller. The control box is powered by a, a microcomputer called a Raspberry Pi. And uh, actually the software that runs the whole thing is called, uh, ironically enough, Strange Brew, Strange Brew Elsinore. So that's what controls the, uh, the pumps controls the uh, the heating elements and monitors the uh, temperature probes and that sort of thing. Now the uh, the next major piece of course is what's called the hot liquor tank or an HLT as it's sometimes referred to and of course it's got one of the heating elements in it uh, a temperature probe and it's got this um, this coil and the coil is used to uh, heat up the uh, water and it's also heating what's called the wort which is the liquid that that eventually becomes beer after it's fermented. So it passes through that coil in the, in the uh, tank of hot water. The next uh, kettle is really called a mash tun. It's the kettle where you circulate the water over top of the grain. So you put the grain in there and it uh, creates what's called the wort. It has a, a false bottom so that the grain doesn't uh, plug up the drain spout when you're trying to circulate the uh, wort. The last one is a boil kettle. And uh, that's where you boil this uh, wort or the liquid that's uh, going to become beer. And it converts the grain starches into uh, sugars. 
and it has what's called a hop stopper on the bottom. It's uh, basically just a screen uh, that makes sure that the hops don't come out and go into the fermenter. Now after boiling the, uh, the wort, you need to uh, cool it down before it's being added to the yeast, and that's what we use the wort chiller for. And uh, basically it's just a tube inside of a garden hose and the cold water runs over top of that tube through the garden hose and, and then down the drain and the, uh, the wort comes out the other end uh, a lot cooler. And of course finally you have uh, a container to uh, ferment all the, uh, the wort in and you add your yeast to that and really that's the, the whole system right there. Now the, the second uh, chart that I want to show you is uh, really some kind of estimates on the cost. You're looking at uh, all the different pieces of equipment that you'd have to buy and uh, how many of them. Of course, I've missed a bunch of stuff, so I just put in an extra miscellaneous category. And really what it, it looks like is if you do this yourself, uh, you build it, put it all together, as my son did, you're looking at about $3,000 uh, of cost for an electric brewery. You can uh, find all that at uh, theelectricbrewery.com, a great website for that. Now, what is the actual uh, cost of making beer in an electric brewery? Well, here's some uh, breakdown. You got the barley for about 20 bucks for uh, 18 pounds of it for a batch. You got hops you'd have to put in, only about $4, about $8 worth of yeast. Some water salts and uh, tablets to put in there, a couple bucks. So your cost per a 10-gallon batch is what... Uh, we're looking at there is uh, thirty-four dollars. Now that works out to about uh, thirty-two cents a beer, which is quite a bit cheaper than uh, than the beer you get at the uh, beer store. And if you wanted to calculate it, the uh, savings uh, that you would get would pay for the uh, the capital investment, the three thousand dollars, in about a year and a half. Uh, now that's all based on if you're uh, drinking a case of beer, you and your buddies are drinking a case of beer a week. And of course, in Canada, a case of beer is 2-4, or 24 bottles. So, you know, a case of beer a week uh, with you and your buddies, and uh, about a year and a half, you've paid off the $3,000 in, uh, in cost savings. So, I'm, not that I'm trying to justify <laughs> the expenditure, but that's how it works out. Okay, so that's the bottom line on an electric brewery. Uh, we looked at the equipment required, uh, the cost to build an electric brewery, and uh, what you might expect the beer to cost uh, all said and done. Next, I'd like to invite you to come along for the ride as uh, my son and I actually brew up a batch of beer in his electric brewery. Now, for those of you that only stayed for the bottom line and that more beer making is really not for you, I, I get it. And uh, thanks for watching. And like they say, I hope to catch you on the flip side. But before you go, be sure to like and subscribe and uh, check out my other videos. Uh, that Retired Guy is now on Rumble, and you can join my Locals community at thatretiredguy.locals.com. Okay, so for all you experienced beer makers, um, let's go and uh, make a strange brew. Now, one thing you know is that the first rule is sanitation. So the first thing we need to do is sanitize all the equipment. Now, here my son is cleaning the carboys, the kettles, uh, Next, we're uh, flushing out all the lines and the hoses. Um, we use a brewery wash uh, for cleaning and, and something called star sand for, uh, for sanitation. So yeah, it takes a bit of time um, to, to uh, clean up everything, but in the end, uh, it's worth the investment. Now, before we get too far into this, let me give you a quick uh, tour of the, uh, the basement uh, electric brewery that my son's got set up down there. You'll uh, see the computer and the uh, controller is over there on the, on the uh, right-hand side and uh, mounted on the wall. We also have a great big uh, vent that we built uh, to make sure that we could vent all the, um, the fumes and everything outside uh, uh, out of there and uh, it works uh, actually pretty good. Now the uh, three kettles are on the uh, stainless steel table there. The uh, hot liquor tank is the first one on the right. The uh, second one is the mash tun and the uh, third one is the boil kettle. The control box is uh, down underneath the uh, the table and uh, the pumps you can see down on the bottom there and the uh, the coil for the cooling coil is the work cooler is off to the uh, bottom um, 
left hand side. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of how the thing is set up in the basement there. Okay, so now let's watch as we cook up another strange brew. So we start off by charging the HLT. Well, that is, uh, we're filling up the hot liquor tank. I mean, don't you just love all this new terminology and the TLAs, you know, the three-letter acronyms? Anyway, we're going to heat the water to a temperature that's uh, just right for mashing. Uh, mashing, that's when you take the uh, grain and you run water over it to extract the sugars out of it. Now, before all that, though, you need to make sure that the water chemistry is just right. We need to get it right so that we can get the best uh, conversion of starches to sugars and the best flavor profile for the beer. Now, pure water comes in at about 7 uh, pH. City water is typically 7.6. Now, you can find out what your water chemistry is by searching out a water report from your city. Now, here's an example. The goal is to get the mash... Uh, pH to be 5.2 to 5.5. Now adding grain to the water will automatically lower the pH, but it may not be low enough. So normally you'll need to add salts like calcium chloride or gypsum or even Epsom salts. Now how much of each that you add will affect the taste of the beer. Calcium chloride gives the beer a kind of a sweet uh, malty flavor, while gypsum makes the beer a little more bitter and drier. Now there's a great spreadsheet you can download for free. It's called the Bruin Water Program at uh, bruinwater.com. Anyways, it'll help you manage your water chemistry. So after loading in your city water results and uh, all the grains that you intend to use, it'll give you the calculations uh, what you need to add. Give it a try. Okay, so mashing. That's the next step in the process. And based on the beer recipe that you've chosen, uh, you now need to measure out the grains. In our case, it's just this one type of barley, a, a German Pilsner malt that we've chosen. Once we have the uh, right quantities, it's off to the grist mill. Now this is something special that I built for my son using his uh, roller mill and an old drill that I had lying around. That plus some scrap wood and voila, you have a grist mill. Uh, works great. The trick on milling the grain is not to make it too fine. You just need to crack the grains and break off the husks. Uh, if it's too fine, like flour, it'll glom up in the mash tun and you won't be able to um, run the water through it. You get what's called a stuck sparge, meaning that the liquid wort won't circulate through the grain bed. Okay, so now you add the grain to the mash tun and stir it in. You got the water to the right temperature, 145 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And after about 15 minutes, you can check the pH. You got to let it kind of soak a bit first. Now, just a note here, the temperature is important because it also affects the flavor. At the lower end, you get a crisp but thinner beer. And at the higher temperature, you get a more full-bodied, sweeter beer. Now, I've mentioned earlier the mash needs to be in a pH range of about 5.2 to 5.5. So here we're checking the mash uh, pH. Often you're going to need to lower the pH by adding lactic acid. Now the mashing process lasts for about an hour. Uh, this is where you circulate the liquid from the bottom of the mash tank through the coil in the hot liquor tank in the HLT and back over to the top of the grain. After an hour, um, you do what's called a mash out. Now this is where you raise the temperature of the mash to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, or for us Canadians, 77 degrees centigrade. Uh, this stops the uh, enzyme conversion and makes the wort more fluid for pumping out. We do this for about 10 minutes uh, before pumping the wort out to the uh, boil kettle. Now we need to switch over the uh, lines now so that we uh, can pump the wort to the boil kettle. As we do that, we'll be also uh, rinsing the grain bed with the water from the HLT. This is called laudering. Now, as the water in the HLT is circulated over the grain bed in the uh, mash tun, it rinses the grains and it's uh, pumped to the boil kettle uh, out the bottom. Wow, I think <laughs> that's a lot of jargon. Technical terms in that sentence, uh, quite a few. Anyway, stay with me now. The next step is to boil the wort. And uh, once again, this is where the electric brewery shines. We have this uh, precise control of the heating. It helps prevent boil overs, uh, something we experienced with the uh, old propane burner that we used to use. 
Now there's uh, two critical points where the boil over is likely. One is when it first starts to boil and, and second is when you add the hops. Both times you risk large amounts of foam frothing up and boiling over. The frothing up is called the uh, hot break, if you want another term. Um, now here you can see me skimming the froth as my son monitors the uh, heating element as it's uh, coming up to a boil. And uh, thankfully we didn't get any boil over and uh, even the hops addition uh, a little later goes smoothly. Now we boil the uh, wort for about 60 minutes. Um, this kills all the bacteria. The hops addition also adds an extra level of protection. It'll take care of some of the uh, spore forming organisms that uh, might survive the boil. Hops in beer was actually an early method of uh, beer preservation and uh, people uh, like it today actually for the flavor but that was the purpose of it. Now while the wort is boiling we have time to empty out the mash tun. Now it's been drained dry and there's uh, spent grain in the bottom of it. Now you might be tempted to throw that in the garbage but hold on a minute. There's recycle value there. Now, spent grain is high in protein and fiber and uh, a lot of trace uh, elements as well. You can use it to make bread, uh, use it for animal feed, and it's especially good actually as uh, compost in your garden. If you want to cook it up, first you have to dry it on cookie sheets and, and then grind it into flour. And I'm told that uh, homemade bread with like 10 to 20% spent grain is delicious. But our real interest is in making dog biscuits. Now Max loves them. Now isn't it interesting that as soon as we start scooping out the spent grain, Max shows up. Hey Max. Hey Max, you coming down to check out the biscuit factory? Yeah. Now the trick is just cook them up with a little bit of bacon bits. You'll have a friend for life. Anyway, back to making this strange brew. Now, after an hour of boiling, we want to cool down the wort uh, so that it can be uh, transferred to a fermenter and uh, then add the yeast. Now, it's best to do this quickly so that the bacteria doesn't have a chance to enter the wort before it's in the fermenter. So for this, we use a counterflow chiller. This improves what's called the cold break, where portions of the uh, tannins uh, become insoluble and uh, they'll settle out um, to give you a cleaner beer. Here you see me monitoring the uh, wart temperature as it exits the chiller. Now the goal is to get the wart chilled down to 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's for ales or 40 to 50 actually if you're trying to make a lager. All this uh, really before you can pitch the yeast. Now pitching, that's just another way of saying add the yeast. Uh, so we filled up these two carboys with the chilled wart and uh, we transfer them over to a uh, modified freezer um, where they'll sit uh, as they ferment. Now this freezer is set up so that it will maintain the optimum temperature for the fermenters within a, using a temperature control switch. We just made the, the lid out of plywood uh, because your average uh, freezer it's not tall enough to handle these fermenters. Now to give the yeast a good head start we add oxygen. It promotes yeast growth. Uh, you can just use an air bubbler, um, you know, like from a fish tank if you want to, but it'll take you about 15 minutes. We use pure oxygen, and uh, that takes less than a minute to do, which, of course, gives you less chance for any kind of contamination to get in. Now, the fermentation will start after about 12 hours, and it'll take about two to three weeks to uh, finish. So here we are. We come back after a few weeks, and we start to keg the beer. We siphon the beer into these uh, ultra-clean kegs. Remember the brewery wash and the star sand? And uh, we moved into our uh, homemade kegerator. Now I'll tell you, this was a piece of genius work. We took a small upright freezer, removed the door, built it into a well-insulated box under the counter, and we added a temperature controller. And of course, we had to install some fans to keep the freezer from uh, burning out because it'll overheat when it's underneath the counter like that. But the thing works like a charm. Anyway, we hook up the CO2 lines and crank up the pressure to about 30 pounds and then just let it sit for a few days. This carbonates the beer and in a few days it's ready to drink. Here we are a few days later, a couple of strange brewers toasting their batch.
Cheers. Cheers. Now, beer in a keg, that'll last about 60 days. But I'm thinking, beer this good? Not going to last that long. You know what they say, the good die young. So, there you have it, a real strange brew. Well, that's our story about making beer in an electric brewery. And if you've stuck with me all this time, you're either a real beer lover, or you've been hypnotized by watching us work. Either way, thanks for watching. Now, be sure to like and subscribe. And until next time, live your best life.